addition to those who are on our sick list in the bulletin, I also want to mention again uh, Charles White, who is Stacy White's brother, and he's been diagnosed with throat cancer, and he will be having tests this week to determine what stage of cancer he is going to be dealing with. Also, Delbert uh, sent a re prayer request for a friend of his, Delbert White did. He said to pray for uh, Ellen Tanner. She has health problems, and uh, Delbert is asking for prayers for Ellen. Also, Henry Miller, who is uh, the father of uh, Ashley Miller, who is uh, Joyce Carter's daughter-in-law, and, and uh, Henry attends at uh, Little Hockey. They, he's going to have a heart procedure and they're requesting prayers for him. Anything else on sick? On the sick list? Uh, we had love and care worship today. It was good. Uh, the ladies were gracious as always. Tomorrow night is the elders and preachers meeting. Thursday night, ladies night out at Western Sizzle at 5.30 and Saturday Men's breakfast south side at Bob Evans. A few changes in the order of worship tonight. Brother Mark will be leaving the singing. Uh, Patrick's going to have the reading. <clears throat> I'll have a prayer. And Brother Mike will be in charge of communion. Elvis will bring the lesson. <coughs> Hallelujah. Revelation. Turn it over to Brother Mark. Most of you know I rarely ever get close to one of these things when I'm leading singing, but <clears throat> I don't have any volume tonight, so I'm going to try this. And if I don't knock you out of your seats, I might stick with it. Father in the morning unto thee Amen. Uh -huh. 
Scripture reading itself this evening will be Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Praise Him in the surrounding of the surrounding trumpet. Praise Him in the harp and lyre. Praise Him with tremble and dancing. Praise Him with the strings and pipe. Praise Him with the clash of the cymbals. Praise Him with surrounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise ye, Heavenly Father. Thank you for being our, our God, and thank you for being all powerful, all loving, and all merciful. We come before thee, Heavenly Father, worshiping you in spirit and in truth, asking you, Heavenly Father, to be with us as we strive to serve you, and we pray, Heavenly Father, that we will always keep the sacrifice of our Savior in, in the forefront of our thoughts so that we might have the opportunity to pursue our salvation in a way that will be pleasing unto you. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to be with the sick of our number that we have mentioned here this evening and this morning. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to bless their families. We ask you, Heavenly Father, for your mercy and your love in the healing of these individuals. We ask you, Heavenly Father, also to be with Ann and Elvis as they Work with us here and we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will bless them and bless their family. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to be with the congregation that meets here and pray, Heavenly Father, for strength and courage for the members. We ask you, Heavenly Father, that you will bless them and be with them. And go with us now, Heavenly Father, through our future lives. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that even sometimes we say and think things that are contrary to your will, that you'll Forgive us of those things if we truly repent, and we pray for strength to do better. We ask you to go with us now, Heavenly Father, and in Jesus' name we ask all these favors and blessings. Save our soul. 
Resolution will be number 714, if you'd like to mark your book. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. It is good to see everyone. Certainly glad you're with us tonight. We'll be looking at Revelation chapter 19 tonight. The first six verses of it. It's interesting we read the song, Psalm 150 on praise the Lord. We've sung a couple songs about the greatness of our God and praise the Lord. And I think, well, maybe it's we're, we're praised because we're almost at the end of the book of Revelation. And it's kind of exciting because with the exception of, of a few things that happen to a few bad people, we'll see at, at, in the next chapter, um, this part of Revelation will be building up on some wonderful things that will happen, and they certainly will be wonderful things. The word, the key word in Revelation 19, you might have guessed it, is hallelujah. The hallelujah you can drop the H off of it, depending on your version. That'd be Alleluia, a couple of different ways. And in the Hebrew, it's spelled even different than that. But it might come to some surprise that the only place the word Hallelujah appears in most English Bibles is in Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. But that word Hallelujah is so ingrained in our religious vocabulary that we assume that it's found throughout the scriptures. Now the Hebrew word for hallelujah is found in, uh, is used in Psalms 24 times, but it is translated praise the Lord in most of those instances. So pretty much from cover to cover, hallelujah is found in this text that we'll be looking at tonight. The reader has encountered many Praise passages in Revelation, but in chapter 19, the praise of God reaches its climax. The heart of worship is praise, lest we ever forget that. Basically, we are to praise God for two things, what he has done and who he is, what God has done and who he is. When we get to heaven, that will be our task is praising God, so we should never get tired of praising God. The psalm, praise him for his mighty deeds, praise him according to his excellent greatness. Psalms 150, verse 2, those read just a few moments ago. In Luke 15, verse 7, there'll be more joy in heaven, more praise, if you will, in heaven over one sinner <coughs> who repents and over 99 just persons who need no repentance. It kind of puts our focus there and, and, and what our joy should be on is, is getting that one sinner back. Now, it's kind of like one at a time. If we get one, then there's going to be another one, there's going to be another one. In verse, uh, the same chapter, in verse 10, the Bible says, in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. So there's, what we see rejoicing in heaven over sinners that are repentant. You want to make God happy, you bring people to repentance, whether it's the first time where, we, where, where they become Christians or it's bringing them back from sin. You know, to understand this passage, such as Revelation 19, we must keep in mind what situation these folks were in. Christians were struggling for existence. Their lives were at stake. They had, according to W.B. West, they had lost members of their families who were fed to the lions in the Colosseum. Can you imagine that? How horrible it was to live in this time period in this area of the country. Who were burned at the stake to illustrate Rome's skies at night. And who were haunted by a pack of savage hounds as they tormentors dressed Christians in the skins of the wild animals. And so we certainly see that there's issues and problems in Rome in, in this time period. Their souls cried out for reassurance, and reassurance is what Revelation gave them. The New Testament makes it clear that it is not the business of Christians to get even. We like to think that sometimes, don't we? That, you know, and, and it's kind of from, from childhood, I think. Well, they did this to me, so I'm going to do this to them. Uh, a little bit here and, and, and that, and, you, you know, it's kind of like, you poke me, I'll poke you. You poke me, I poke you. And we kind of learned that. But Jesus said, I say that you love your enemies, 
Bless those that curse you. Do good to those that hate you. Sometimes that's hard, isn't it? That's the, 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 the slogan of, of someone poking you and you do good to them. Someone pokes you, you do good to them. Someone pokes you, you do good to them. Someone doesn't like you, someone hates you, you are good to them. See the difference? We're, we're kind of taught the world view of that. If someone doesn't like you, well, you just don't like them back. Why don't you like them? I don't know, they don't like me. Why don't they like you? I don't know why they don't like me. I've never asked them. So I go through my whole life not talking to that person. Does that make any sense? Not really. Jesus says, listen, love your enemies. Bless your enemies. Do good to your enemies. Pray for those who use you and persecute you. So the business of getting even has never been part of Christianity. Romans chapter 12 and verse 14, bless those who persecute you and bless and do not curse. Just a few verses down in verse 17, we see repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. No, and so, so our attitude as Christians has to be this attitude of doing good, doesn't it? They do bad to us, we do good to them. It's kind of the opposite. Now, if someone does bad to me for a certain amount of time, and, and I don't repay them evil, and, and all I do is good, that's going to get to them after a while, isn't it? That might even drive them crazier than if I'm good, than if I'm mean to them. Because they're expecting, if they do a little something for me, then I'm going to poke it back at them. They're expecting that, and they're ready to poke back again, and then I'm ready to poke back again. But if, if they poke at me, I just say, thank you. People get a little, well, what's that about? And they do it again, and I say, well, that was great. You know, they're going to think differently. Now look, two more verses down in verse 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. It's not my decision. It doesn't matter what they do to me, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So if they do something, if you're looking in the first century, so if they come in and, and arrest my family and kill my family and do all these things, it's not my task to repay them. I just need to be obedient to them. Because God will take care of that. It's kind of like having a big brother. Have you ever had a big brother? I, I learned about big brother years and years and years ago. I was out of the country. I was in the Bahamas. This was, I was probably 20 years old. I found myself with my friend in the Bahamas, and we were laying on the beach. And the Bahamas is a foreign country, as far as you can, you know, it's Or at that time, you just had to have a driver's license. And, and I was laying there on the beach, and all of a sudden, these fighter planes, I mean, they were flying low, came flying over. And me and my buddy are looking at each other, like, uh oh, here comes this, you know, like M15 or F17s or whatever they are. And there was formation of them. This, there was probably six or eight of them. And they were just, you know, you could look at them, you know, almost like you could touch them, they were flying so low. And, and we looked up, and you saw the big American flags on those things. And you're like, who's that? That's Big Brother. He's watching over you. He's making sure nothing in the Bahamas happens bad. You know? God is kind of like Big Brother. He's watching over us. He is protecting us. And it's not our job to do any of that. But we do learn this, that, that you know, to, to look at this passage a step further, it was asserted that the principal theme of this passage is, is not vengeance, but it's vindication. And the vindication referred to including the, the, the vindication of Christians. Rome killed them as criminals, but God raised them as saints. The background of this chapter is this, the question whether God's rule or Satan's deception power is triumphant in human affairs. Who is it going to be? Is it going to be God or is it going to be Satan? 
And it seems to be a power struggle here, if you will. And some may object, but God should be merciful to sinners and even those who, who, who consistently and unceasingly disobey his will. But if God allows fragrant disobedience to go unpunished, the message would, would not be that God is merciful, but that God is indifferent and, and that he doesn't care that men sin. Regarding the case at hand, it would be announced that God was indifferent to idolatry, indifferent to oppression, and even indifferent to suffering of his people. Albert Baldwin said this about this passage, there are members more important than the misery or the happiness of individuals whose communities it would be, whose communities, it would be a fearful thing if men could travel unchallenged the criminal path of rebellion against eternal justice and never be called into account. Now, we know that in our lifetime, some people travel that road, but eternally they'll be called into account. Ray Summers concluded this, it is not a song of rejoicing over evil which has fallen upon Rome as much as it is a song of rejoicing over the triumph of righteousness and truth. Remember, this, this praise comes shortly after we look at chapter 18, where we're the announcement that that role will fall. And so then we see this praise lifting up. So as we look at this passage tonight, Romans chapter 19, or excuse me, Revelation chapter 19 and verses 1 through 6. If you have your Bibles, join me. This, verses 1 through 6. After this, I heard what seemed to be a loud noise of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. What a, what a kickstart that is in that verse there. Uh, um, it's just showing that the power of God now, we'll talk about these things, the, the salvation and the glory and the power in just a minute. Verse 2, for his judgments are true. His judgments are just, for he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his saint, uh, servants. Once more, they cried out, hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And 24 elders and four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice, praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him small and great. Well, that sounds wonderful, doesn't it? But the occasion, like I mentioned just a few moments ago, is the destruction of Rome. The, that Rome would not do the things that, that that Rome was going to do. Now when we look at the first verse of chapter 19, we're responding to the, the, the charge given in chapter 18. Chapter 18, verse 20 says this, Rejoice over her, that is Babylon, O heavens, O you saints, you apostles, you prophets, because God has pronounced judgment against her. So the sobbing and the silence of chapter 18 are followed by the swelling of, of praise in chapter 19 and heavenly chorus saying hallelujah, salvation, glory, power, be long to God. That's important because salvation, glory, and power, those three things, we attribute those to God, but Rome believed that glory and power were uniquely theirs. Rome insisted that Caesar was the savior of the world. So those three things, the government said, well, we have all those. We are all those. We are salvation. We, we, we are power and, and we are glory. And, and sometimes we, we think that today, we talked a little bit about that this morning, we give man the credit when it's really God. As men and women, we have the power to do a lot of things, but we never have the power to be God. When we think back of how we were created, we 
knew there had to be a God that's drawn. Well, we knew that, that you know, and, and all the stories that I read in, in, in history and that I look through the Bible and, and how simple Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 is and how well explained it, it, the, the history of creation is in those books makes me want to believe that that's true. But then I see all the creation around me and, and, and understand how complicated my system is, your system is. By chance, could we have two eyes? That's part of God's plan. By chance, could we have one nose? Can you imagine if we had two noses, what would we look like? Two ears, one what? Mouth. It means we should listen as much as, or, or look more than we talk, maybe, I don't know. We have two arms. We could, God could have wanted to create us with three. And, you know, two legs, two feet, ten toes, five on each. Most people, some people have said. You, you know, but that's the outside. What about the inside of us? We're all exactly the same. We all have a heart that pumps blood and the same arteries are there. Now mine's a little bit different than yours because they moved some of mine around once. But the same arteries. The lungs are the same. And so we're, we're so magnificently, magnificently made that we can't be by chance. You know, and we've all seen explosions. As a little kid, we like, we love explosions as kids. You know, like, ah, put it up. <laughs> what's it create? It creates a mess. Explosion equals destruction. If you don't believe me, go ahead and take something. Don't make it too big. Don't blow your house up or anything. But go ahead home and try it. It's going to make a mess. Explosion doesn't make creation. God makes creation. And, and so when we begin to get that power and glory and, and think it's all of us that's doing that and it's government that's doing that and, and, and you know, you have to kind of take a step back because God will only take that for so long. And then we'll see a scene like we see in chapter 18 and chapter 19. We're at the portion of where they've been destroyed and we have glory from that destruction. William Barclay wrote this, each of these three great attributes of God should awaken its own response in the heart of man. The salvation of God should awaken, great, excuse me, awaken the gratitude of man. Salvation of God should awaken our gratitude. The glory of God should awaken the reverence of man. The power of God should awaken the trust of man. Gratitude, reverence, and trust. These are are constant elements of real praise. Well, we see Paul say in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. See, Paul says it, it doesn't matter. And certainly Paul went through some rough times and, and, and as we're studying on Wednesday night, he's He's shipwrecked at sea and all these things. And he's going through some horrible times. He's, he's persecuted. And, and he says, listen, God will rescue me. We can look out and see the other side. So why did the singer speak of God in such exalted terms? Because his judgments are true and righteous. And our judgments are often flawed. Because God's judgments are always true and always right. God alone is perfect in judgment for three reasons. First, he alone can see the innermost thoughts and desires of man. We talked a little bit about this this morning, but God alone can see what's in our hearts, our thoughts and our desires. That makes him perfect. No one else can know our thoughts. No one else knows our desires. Secondly, he alone has the purity which can judge without prejudice. God alone. You know someone else that has the purity of God? Well, Christ, but they're one, really. And thirdly, he alone has the wisdom to find the right judgment 
and the power to apply it. The perfect judgment, if you will. Not too harsh, if you will, not too light. The perfect judgment and the power to apply it. So the psalm then turns from a general to a specific, particular to uh, truth and righteousness of judgment. In verse 2, for he has judged the great harlot. For truth and righteousness are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servant by servant shed by her. So when we think of this, she has, she meaning Rome, has corrupted the earth. Well, how has Rome corrupted the earth? Well, we, it, you know, the harlot here is the city of Rome. Rome was the center from which evil poured out to every sector of ancient society. She was the center to which flowed all the diabolical devices conceived in the depraved mind of man. It kind of rolled downhill. She suggested all these things to all these other nations around her. It's interesting because to understand this, we look at Old Testament history and we look at those nations that were in the, in the promised land before they were exiled out of the promised land. Canaanites. Look at the history of a, a nation like Canaanites. And, and we can see all the depravity and all those things that went on in that nation. And, and, and of course, the Hittites and the Hivites and, and, and on the Moabites and all those. All those nations had all those evil things and they, they flow from one nation to another. And, and, and once one nation started doing it, and, and it very quickly flowed to other nations. How do we do that in our day and time? How does evil flow? If you were Satan for a day, how would you make evil flow in our day and time, 2020? Several ways, I would think. If I was Satan for a day, don't want to be Satan, but if I was Satan for a day, I would use television. Because who doesn't have a television? Everybody does, don't they? Just about. Everybody I know has a TV. Well, what if they don't? Well, we'll get them through YouTube. Now, there's good, there's, there's good and bad with everything, isn't there? You know, there's good things on YouTube. The sermon by tomorrow will be on YouTube. Sunday morning sermon by tomorrow, I mean tonight even, will be on YouTube. There's good and bad on everything. But also, you know, it, it, it's, I can get in your brain that way and show you things that, that might look good to you and try to convince you that, wow, this is, you, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a, a lie, if you will. I'm trying to convince you that sin is okay, that sin is good, that sin is acceptable. If I'm saved for a day. I'll also get you on social media. If I couldn't get you on TV, if I get you on something like YouTube, social media, I get you going somehow. Satan uses these devices and so many more because I, I think Satan looks at different se sectors of people, different people, and says, well, I know he will trip up or she will trip up if we do this. It might not bother someone else, but it might bother that person. So certainly that's the case, and, and certainly Rome was the type of city that, that used everything it could to spread the evil out to all the world. Her sin had piled up as high as heaven in chapter 18, verse 5, it says that. You imagine how sin would have to pile up, and pile up, and pile up. She has lost. She has forgot about God. When we look at verse 3 and 4, again, they shouted, Hallelujah, the smoke. Now, smoke in the Old Testament was used for offerings for God. It's, it's kind of a, a praise that you could use a burnt offering. And the smell of the smoke was a, a, a lovely fragrance to God in the Old Testament. The smoke from her goes up uh, forever and ever. 24 elders, now 24 was always 
kind of the, the number we use in Revelation being the perfect number, 12 apostles, 12 tribes. They kind of put that together here, kind of 24 elders and four living creatures fell down and worshiped God. In other words, the, the completeness fell down and worshiped God. The church, if you will, fell down to worship God, who was seated on the throne, where should God be? And they cried out, Amen and Hallelujah. You see in Jude chapter 1, verse 7, as we looked at this morning, even Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, set forth an example of suffering and vengeance of eternal life. And, and, and so you, you can kind of see there, Rome is, is going down that, that same road when we look at verse uh, verses 9 or verse, verses 4 we'll go back to verse 4 the praise continued there as, as we saw they added their amen to what the heavenly chorus had said shouting hallelujah amen indicates a hearty approval so they approve what is there they praise God for what he has done verse 1 through 4 Embedding the embedded the, the praise for what God has done was praise for the character of God. Verse one implying that He is our glorious and powerful Savior. Verse two indicates that He is just, true, and righteous. And beginning with verse five, however, the song focuses on praise for who God is. A voice came from the throne, giving praise to our God. All you his bondservants, you who fear him, small and great. How many fear God? This was probably the voice of the one of the four creatures who was in the center and around the throne. Well, we look at verse 6. In verse 6, then I heard what sounds like a great multitude, like a roar of rushing waters, like a loud pearls of thunder shouting hallelujah. Can you imagine that? We've heard thunder, the rainstorms happen. And sometimes thunder is shocking. You, know, you see that I, I was in Florida for a number of years, so I, I got used to it. I would see the lightning and then count one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, boom. The number of 1,000s you get, it means the miles away the thunder is. You get the 10, 1,000, it means the Thunder is about 10 miles, the lightning strike would be about 10 miles away. So we learned that kind of here, so I'm kind of used to waiting for that, waiting for that crack. If you get to like one, then you kind of might be in trouble. But we're used to that, kind of used to that crack, but sometimes it's startling, isn't it? Because it's loud and it's mighty. And, and can you imagine that the, the, I heard a sound like a great multitude, like a roar rush, or more of rushing water, you, that, that water just comes in there like pearls of thunder shouting. And this is what hallelujah for our Lord God Almighty reigns. There is the praise for God. And this truth gave first century Christians hope. And, and, and it should give us hope also. In the midst of, of trials, they could believe in a better tomorrow. Isn't that the case? We can believe in a better tomorrow. Whatever happens today in this world, well, we hope it goes a certain way. But what if it doesn't? We go through the trials that we have to go through. We always keep God number one. We serve our God and we look forward to a better tomorrow. And we give God the praise for whatever happens because Jesus is king. And that's the way they looked at it. Jesus was their king. So they had to live in a situation that, that was, wasn't great was was unfamiliar to them and, and and was just difficult. Well, that was bad. They had to see family members that, that, that had to go through hard times, maybe even death, 
well, well, that was bad, but it wasn't their task to get vengeance. It was their task to praise the Lord, their task to know that God is their protective, kind of like the big brother, that God will always be there for the Christian and that no matter what happens today, tomorrow will be better. Tomorrow will be brighter. And where should the Christian stand? The Christian should stand in the mighty arms of Jesus and know that our task is to teach and preach Jesus Christ to the world and hope and pray that the world receives Christ. For if they don't, we need to understand that there will be a brighter day tomorrow for us. The first step in that is understanding our relationship with God. How is our relationship with God. I, I can't worry about anybody else until I worry about myself, if you will. I, I can't be concerned with your relationship with God until I'm concerned with my relationship with God. And, and the first thing I need to do is believe that Jesus Christ, and that, that's the, 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 the key to everything, is my belief and your belief in Jesus Christ. That he is the King of kings and Lord of lords that he came to this earth, that he lived, that he preached, they arrested him, he was tried, he died, he was buried, and three days later he rose. And then shortly after that, he ascended into heaven at the right hand of the Father. If you believe in that Jesus, the rest of that is it, 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 it's just to act out that belief. That you say, I do believe that. I want to become a Christian. I want to be obedient to the Word of God. You put him on in baptism. We hope that if you haven't done that, you'll do that. Or, or maybe if you've wandered <laughs> from the faith, you need encouragement. You need to be uplifted. You need prayers. We'll pray with you and pray for you. Won't you come as we stand, as we sing? <laughs> Someday you'll stand at the bar on high. Someday you'll record you'll see. Someday you'll answer the question of life. What will your answer be? What will it be? Please be seated.
see them. Being the first day of the week, uh, we have uh, still have the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper. So uh, if you're in need to partake of it, we'll uh, have a prayer at this time for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer at this time. Thank you for the sacrifice, Father, that was uh, made uh, almost 2,000 years ago, Father. And we pray, Father, that. As we partake of this bread, which you supplied for us, more importantly, we pray, thank you for the, the body which was sacrificed that, that we are to remember at this time. And we pray that as we partake of this bread, it be done in a way that is pleasing in you. And through Jesus' holy name, amen. Dear Father, we continue in prayer. Thank you, Father, for the... Uh, the blood that was shed on that cross, Father. And we thank you, Father, for supplying us with this fruit of the vine, which we can take at this time to help us remember, Father, that blood that was shed. We pray, Father, that uh, you would be with those who are partaking it at this time again so that they keep their mind focused on the sacrifice, Father, and the purpose of this uh, cup. And we just pray that it be done in a way that's pleasing to you. We Pray again through Jesus' holy name. Amen. Uh, well, this for, uh, concludes the Lord's Supper. Uh, there's a basket back there if anyone would like to uh, put your contribution in on that table. If there's no other announcements. Good morning. I'd like for anybody that was participating to take the scissors buzzer from the table quick after church. Okay. Anybody hear that? Gene wants the Secret Sisters to have a short meeting. Uh, and there's nothing else. Uh, we just need to remember all those who've been uh, on our prayer list and uh, sick and traveling and all sorts of things. So uh, let's uh, have a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, again come to you in prayer. And the close of the service, Father, just thank you for the opportunity to, to live in a country, Father, where we have the freedoms to come and worship you, Father. And, and we just uh, thank you, Father, that we do not live in, under the rule like we did or like the Christians did in, in the Roman times when we would have been studying about, Father. We just pray, Father, that uh, you would... Uh, Continue to bless this country like you have so blessed it so much. And we just pray again, Father, with the upcoming elections this week that, that the American people would look to you for guidance before they cast their vote. And, Father, that we just pray that, that we would elect officials that would uh, be pleasing unto you, people who would make laws that would be in accordance with your will. Forgive us all where we have sinned against you. Guide us in our daily decisions. We'll pray all this through Jesus' holy name. Amen. <clears throat>